in that first part of the lecture, we had a look at the institutions of memory that exist and a sense of where you might turn to look for materials and information. In this part of the lecture, we're going to look at the kinds of things that are produced and the kinds of things that other historians have found really useful in their research. So let's get started. Having told you about the wealth of information held at national and state level in those institutions of memory, and having mentioned that there is private material held, particularly in the National Library as well, in this part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about the kinds of records that don't fetch up there and where you might be able to locate them. And it's worth knowing that the state makes records that it doesn't put into these institutions, that instead it stores in other repositories. One of the great sources of information for historians are records produced by courts, and they're not held in the National Library or the National Archives. Courts of various types and their records provide insight into societies, and that's something that that reading from the first week spoke about. And there are a whole range of courts. In the 1970s and 1980s, Inquisition records were discovered as a source of social history. So records which were kept by religious courts. In those records, the inquisitors might be inquiring after people's beliefs, but they capture a whole lot more detail about their lives. And just to let you know, the Inquisition was not limited to Spain. There were Inquisitions throughout the Catholic world in the early modern period. The Spanish one is famous and unexpected, but it's not the only one. And Spain is not the only region of Europe that is subjected to the Inquisition. And those various Inquisitions have produced records which historians have picked up. One of the famous examples is this book, The Cheese and the Worms, which reproduced the world of a 16th century miller by reading his encounters with the Inquisition. He had a couple of encounters. Ginsburg unpicks what he's reading, he's unpicking the connections for ideas and exchange of ideas in this Miller's world. And the title comes from the Miller's description of the cosmos, that there is the world and the angels are like the worms that are poking their heads out of it. His second engagement with the Inquisition didn't work out well for him. And historians of the early modern period continue to wax lyrical over this book. So you're welcome to go and find it and read it and possibly enjoy it. Court records don't end with the Inquisition. There are many more and I've put up a couple of links on the slide so that you can chase some down if that's what interests you. Court records are now being crunched using new technology and they can be used to shed light on the lives of ordinary people who might not write their own stories but who can be detected, who can be fleshed out through these interactions with officialdom. And so there are a range of different courts and a wide variety of court records and a wide range of places where those records can be accessed. Court records aren't the only form of official records that don't end up in the national or state archives. Other forms of official records are also created and also kept elsewhere and their locations might not immediately spring to mind. It's worth knowing that the census was managed by the Commonwealth only after 1911. Before that, it was managed by the individual colonies and states. This is a point I'm afraid I might not have made quite clearly enough in the first lecture. Before 1901, there was no Australia, and so the federal collections don't hold material relating to government before that period. It's held by the states. Here, the census is not passed over to the Federation until 1911, and so those official records rest with the states. Beyond that, it's worth thinking about where your life brushes up against officialdom, and so what records of you might remain, and potentially of other people. And there are all sorts. I've listed some on the slide, but you can think about your own contacts with officialdom and perhaps the contacts of family members. The location of these kinds of holdings, these kinds of records, 
aren't consistent between place. For example, in Townsville, council records are held at city libraries. There's a great collection there. You can go and access them. It's different in Brisbane. In Brisbane, there's a separate records office that researchers need to know about and to access. And finding out what is held where is part of the process of doing research. In addition, that twitching in your fingers comes into play because you've got to have a sense of what might be out there that might help you work out what you want to know. And sometimes it works the other way around. So generally I'm saying you've got a question you want to answer and you go looking for records. Other historians work the other way around. They find an archive and they delve into it to find out what it will tell them. So for example, my first real research project was on the debate surrounding the use of 1080 poison in New Zealand, and it was sparked by the money, which was donated by the Agricultural Pests Destruction Council, but also by the records that were donated by the Agricultural Pests Destruction Council or by the people who had been involved with it. I came into boxes of records. That's how I discovered my topic. I then went and found other sources to fill in the gaps or to flesh out my understanding. But those boxes of records lived in my parents' house for some decades. They're now lodged with the National Archives of New Zealand. And so there's a set of archives that led to a project. Much more glamorously, Nicole Moore experienced finding 793 boxes of confiscated books in the National Archives of Australia building in Sydney. And she has built her career on that unexpected treasure trove. There's a link at the bottom of the slide if you wish to find out more about that set of events. And so there are state produced records which are not held in national or state archives. There are other kind of semi-official records which are maintained by organisations other than the various levels of government. So these are what I would refer to as semi-official records, newspapers of record. They're not produced by governments, but they're really important to researchers. And fortunately for us, they have fetched up in fair numbers at the National Library. There are other things, school records, business records, church records, almanacs. Now, some organisations run their own archives. There is a video tour of the Townsville Catholic Archive because the Catholic Church runs its own archive and holds a lot of records about the Catholic Education Office and so those Catholic schools. And it's got some extraordinary items within that archive. Other organisations such as businesses need to hold on to their records too, although businesses don't last forever. And so some of that material then fetches up in libraries. JCU's own special collections hold archives from business organisations such as the Delta Ironworks because they've been rescued essentially and captured by the very effective librarians at JCU. And so where these records end up is down to chance to some degree. And it means that as a researcher, you've got to have that twitching in your fingers because there's not always a logical reason for some records having survived or for their location in the present. So it's worth going and delving into the holdings of various libraries that you can find access to. Libraries tend to hold published material, but their collections extend beyond that, depending on what has been donated. And also they hold artifacts which are produced by librarians. And cutting books are absolutely brilliant. They're essentially collections of newspaper clippings. Some are produced by private individuals and donated to the library. Others, librarians have actually put together themselves so that you don't need to search through all the newspapers. Instead, librarians have identified significant news items about topics which are significant. And it's a curious outcome of digitization that in many ways it has made the published material held by libraries much less significant and these kind of 
semi-random collections which they've accumulated much more important. Rare books, rare published books are becoming much more available online, even manuscript material in the form of the medieval manuscripts. Now, those books which weren't published exactly, they were copied by hand and so are unique in each volume. They're becoming widely available online as they're digitized and there are those projects to get books that are out of copyright online and available to anyone from anywhere. And I'm sure you're aware of some of those projects, projects like Project Gutenberg, the Hathi Trust, the Internet Archive. These quirky collections aren't just held by libraries and archives. Museums can also hold personal papers, depending on who donated what, where, when. And there are a wide range of wonderful collections out there that again, you have to come across or detect in people's footnotes before you can access them. Some universities hold amazing research collections. James Cook University is blessed in this way. Uh, down in Dunedin, the Hocken Library deals with the South Island in amazing detail. In Melbourne, places like the Melbourne University Archive also hold an interesting collection, although that collection tends to be focused on the university itself. And public libraries are amazing. I remember happy days in the Auckland Public Library, working my way through Straight Furrow, which was the official magazine of the Federated Farmers. The Forest and Bird Magazine, New Zealand Wildlife, which was the New Zealand Deer Stalkers Association magazine, and also visiting their special collections, where I found that Governor Gray's letters had been transcribed and had an index Probably they're digitized by now. At the point I was doing that research, it was wonderful to find that I wasn't having to try and interpret his handwriting. And new collections are springing up, many of them private, because there is money in family history. Let me say the public libraries are doing a great job of supporting family history research, but it's also a commercial proposition because of this extraordinary enthusiasm for it. And so there are private research interfaces that are being developed. There may well be others perhaps around military history, which is again something that excites passion. But that is being effectively colonized by ancestry. I'm sure you've come across ancestry. After all, it sponsors that television series, Who Do You Think You Are? And it's interesting to know it's run by the Latter-day Saints. The Latter-day Saints hold that people cannot enter heaven without being baptized, but they also accept that baptism may occur after death, which explains why they have sought out and collected births and deaths records. More births than deaths for the interesting part. They're trying to get us all into heaven, which is extremely generous of them. And so family historians used to go on a pilgrimage to Salt Lake City in Utah to visit their holdings. With the rise of digitization, they've gone online, and Ancestry has those collections and that organization behind it. And as I said, it's extending its reach and finding all sorts of records that it can place online. Those holdings are replicated to some degree by local family history libraries, and there is one in Townsville. And many public libraries also have dedicated family history sections. In this area, there's a mix of private enterprise repositories springing up, as well as that material in the public system. There are other things that historians can work with as well. Artifacts are more commonly associated with archeologists and anthropologists, but they can be consulted by historians as well. Some of them find their ways into libraries. And in the reading from the first week, there's a mention of some of the artifacts that have found their way into the court archive that that author is consulting. Historians tend not to consult artifacts as primary sources, but they often use them in historical displays to evoke a sense of tangible connection with the past. And they can reveal information. They can unsettle preconceived ideas about what things were like in the past. I'm not entirely comfortable using them. I certainly wouldn't be comfortable summoning up this artifact from the National Archives at Kew in London. 
but I do compromise on halfway items, items like ephemera, which are things that are produced to not be stored and not be kept, things like programs and flyers and signage and posters. And so when there are collections of these things, they are an extraordinary insight into particular moments in the past. Later in the subject, we will spend time considering how to use images and how to manage them because they're also being collected and made more available in the present. But they are often available through library systems. And so we don't need to think about new places to go and seek them out. And I'm going to wind this portion of the lecture up at this point. I've made the point that there are all sorts of records out there and all sorts of places where they lurk. I've probably given you the impression that research requires luck as well as skill, as well as sheer bloody mindedness to bash through unpromising collections and lists in the hope of managing to find some item that can tell you what you want to know. And I may have given you that impression because it is correct. There are all sorts of collections out there and you need to keep your minds open and to seek them out because it's hard to predict what you're going to need to consult. And it's hard to predict what traces of the past have survived through to the present. So at this point, I'm going to send you on those video tours. I'd like you to go and watch the video tour of the JCU Library Special Collections and see some of the things it holds. In addition, there's a video on the quirkiness of archival holdings starring my student, Patrick White. And I hope that video will give you a sense of how collections get built partly by chance. There's also a bonus beautifully produced video on parts of the library's collections. The online quizzes start this week and can be found in the assessments folder of LearnJCU.